Hey everybody, what's up? I'm Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You guys know the show. This is where I sit down with amazing humans. I do everything I can to unpack their brains and help you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today is a musician. He's half of the group Pomplemousse. Uh, he's a YouTube star, but probably most notably, you may know him as the co-founder and CEO of Patreon. My guest is Jack Conti. What's up? Yes! <laughs> We did it. We made it happen. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the show. You, you traveled a whopping six blocks or something like that. Yeah, it's to a, our it's studios a here very in San Francisco. Short, painless walk. We're close. Yeah. And we were just talking. Uh, I, I end up saying this a fair bit because anytime someone who's about to be in the show, we're talking as we're getting mic'd up, and we started a thread of a conversation. I just want to jump right back into. We agreed to stop. Like, let's, let's do it. Save it for the for, the, for <laughs> where we're recording, and that is your. Transition from musician, I don't want to call it transition, that's probably the wrong word. Yeah. Your sort of addition of a new set of roles and responsibilities when you founded Patreon after being a career musician. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we have similar paths that like we were talking about that. Mine was from photography. and Weirdly we, similar. Yes. We're, we're unlikely founders, <laughs> I think is the words that we were using prior to the camera's role. But tell me your story. Like you're, you're making music to now you're, you're the co-founder and CEO of a company that's raised a ton of money and serving tens of thousands of creators all over. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been a, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I've been a professional YouTuber for the last 10 years. I've made my living, you know, making YouTube videos, making music and, uh, and uploading things online and hustling to try and figure out how the hell to convert that <laughs> into a living and, and money. And, um, and yeah, about five years ago, I started working on this music video that I ended up pouring my like life into, including my entire savings account. Um, maxed out two credit cards. Uh, got this like roboticist hobbyist to build this head that sang the lyrics to the song, and not CGI, like an actual robot head singing the lyrics to the song. And then the other robot was this like hexapod, 3D printed thing that the, that this guy from the University of Tucson built. It was the most intense music video I ever made in my life. Took me three months. I was working like 19 hour days. It was crazy. And at the end of all this, I uploaded the video, got about a million views. That's what I was getting at the time. And uh, I checked, I remember checking my dashboard. I got 166 bucks from that million views. Um, after dra like $10,000 and maxing out two credit cards, I was like, fuck <laughs> this. Something like, is wrong. This something is so, because I yeah. made this behind the scenes video and my, Fans saw the behind the scenes video. They knew how hard I worked. They were so pumped about this thing. It was clearly like the best thing I'd ever made in my life. And it was just a, like such a, it was such a light that was shining on the fucked up, super broken system online right now that converts art. People call it content. I hate that. Too, it's hate art it. <laughs> that converts art into dollars for the people who make the art. And the way the web is set up right now sucks for, for solving that problem. And it was a moment where I looked up and I felt like we got to do something about this. And? And I called it my co-founder. <laughs> okay, the next part of the story. Hey man, we got to do something about <laughs> yeah. this. It was my freshman year roommate from school. We just got so much luck here, you know, so yeah. much weird happenstance and luck. Um, and he, I pitched him this idea for Patreon. I sort of drew it out on 14 sheets of printer paper. He got so pumped about it. Started coding it that night, actually. Wow. And we launched three months later. He built the whole thing by himself in three months. Sam uh, is his name, Sam Yam. He's a, a monster engineer and product thinker and just an amazing human being. He built this whole site by himself. And we, we launched within two weeks of launching Patreon. I was the first creator on Patreon. We, we launched with three creators, me, my roommate, and my girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> See, if you're trying to build it for an audience of a billion people on day one, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Three people. It was three right. people on Patreon. That was it. And uh, yeah, within like two weeks of launching, I was making uh, like over 5,000 bucks per month. Um, and it was just this moment where, you know, you AB the YouTube dashboard, $166, Patreon, $5,000. And it's, it is so, it was like explosive. Yeah. I mean, creators started signing up in droves because it was just, there yeah. are so few products that actually pay you for being a creative artistic person. And this was a, 
this was the you know a, a first in so many ways and creators just you know it, the rest is history we ended up we got so many support tickets that we had to raise money and hire people and then build an office and I think the word we used was unintentional founder yes yeah I, I mean it, I, I it was a snowball that kind of rolled and suddenly we, we found ourselves managing people and building a company and looking for office space and you know and the rest is history that's virtually the exact same experience that I had building Creative Live. Yeah. Uh, looking out there, realizing that the industry is fragmented and that there was a bunch of misinformation and in information portrayed in negative contexts and learning was growing, but there were a, a cross section of people who didn't want to see it grow. I'm not saying that YouTube doesn't want to see it grow, but YouTube's taking YouTube's money. Right, totally. and they're trying to keep give you just enough to keep you interested. Yep. Uh, and so we saw a similar industry and and uh, or an opportunity, and never really like I can't wait to be a founder and manage people and and have venture capital, but there's a certain calling. Yeah, right? yeah. The the way I, I kind of think of it is like um, I don't have a tattoo, <laughs> but um, if I were gonna get a tattoo, it wouldn't be because I want a tattoo. It would be because there's something that I want to see every day. And I want I want to remind myself of that thing every single day. Um, I think starting a company is a similar kind of thing. If you're starting a company because you want to start a company, that's not the right reason to start a company. Sure. If you're starting a company because there's some problem that you just can't help but solve, if it's just in your veins and it's just the most important thing and you must do it, then a company is a good way to accomplish that. But because um, there's a formal structure for bringing people on board, and you can pay them in exchange for their time and energy, and, and it can scale, yeah. and yeah, and and so yeah, at least for me, you know, the the, it, the reason Patreon is here is because this problem is so important, and it's so uh, creators have been systemically pushed down for thousands of years, and with the internet now, all of that can go away. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's such a it is the best time in the history of humans, literally in the history yes. of humans, to be an artist right now in 2018. And if you don't believe it, just check yourself, right? Seriously, I think that's the thing that, like, the sky is falling, the value of photography is X, the, you know, my design services are no longer valued. All, look, at, there's infinitely more money being made, converted, infinitely more ideas being created and shared, infinitely more photographs, designs, all those things are at an all-time high and rising, still rising. So I understand that as individual creators, sometimes we feel alone, sometimes we feel lost, sometimes we feel afraid, all those things. If you're, if you're not feeling those things, also probably doing it wrong. Something is, is <laughs> hey, not right with you. No, I'm just, I, I, I paraphrase. But I believe, as you do, that it is an amazing time. In part because tools like Patreon, in part because you're leveraging the, the internet. But let's, let's put this, let's put a pin in this just for a second. Pink. And I want to do two things. I want to first say that I believe that there is a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. and I want to get your take on this. I believe there's a misunderstanding of how artists have always made money. Mm -hmm. There have basically always been patrons of the arts, right? Mm -hmm. People who are funding, like the Sistine Chapel ceiling mm -hmm. didn't get painted by a volunteer painter. Nope. Okay. <laughs> he was very well funded mm -hmm. and he had people who were willing to write checks to support him in his in his endeavors. Yeah. So while this is new, yeah. It's not entirely new. It's not new at all. But what you've done is scale it. So yeah. help the folks at home if you don't know what Patreon is this is going to be an amazing episode for you because you're about <laughs> to go sign up for a new service. Um, but so give us a little like how you see historically how you look at how artists were paid and then what you've done as sort of an homage or you've taken a piece of that and where you <coughs> want to take this. Okay. Uh, I remember pitching Patreon to VCs and um, some folks get it and some folks don't. Because uh, it's a little weird. It's a membership platform, right? That just makes it easy for creators to get paid. and. You sign up not to buy a piece of content. When you, when you pay five bucks a month, you're not paying five dollars a month to, uh, you're not paying five dollars to download a song right. or to get a digital good on your computer. It's not a transaction, it's membership. You're paying five bucks a month to a person so that they can keep being creative. 
um, it's, it's similar to um, you know, something that KQED might do or um, being a member of the New York Times or SF MoMA. It's the digital online version of that, right? It's a membership platform. Um, and I remember talking to some VCs and they were saying things like, wait a minute, so this is like uh, voluntary payments? And I was like, ugh. No, I was like, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're thinking of it like that, we shouldn't be in business yeah. together. Um, because I think the, the ultimately, and your, your question was about the historical context here, the truth is some people think that it's weird. It's not weird at all. At all. It's only in the last hundred years, literally since, since the turn of the century, around 1900, that, that um, we, we started putting art, our art, on physical things, audio and video, we, you know, the invention of celluloid, the yeah, invention of tape wax. And photography tape, photography. Yeah. Yep. A wax cylinder to record audio and, and then, you know, turning that into records and, um, and then packing those things up and shipping them around the world and building billions of dollars of infrastructure and industry to move a physical good from a manufacturing facility to the hands of a consumer. Um, there's a hundred years of infrastructure there. Um, and, but that's only since 1900. Before that, artists were paid like you said. They were paid, oh, hey, yeah. you're, you're a cool person. You make good stuff. I like the things you make. I'm going to pay you. I mean, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, um, when it debuted, um, the names of his five patrons were in the libretto. Uh, he, he was getting paid because people said, wow, I really like your music. Here's a bag of coins. Go make more music. Yep. That's how the arts have been funded for a long Millennia. Yeah, yeah, so forever. <laughs> <laughs> and and when you sit down with the venture capital folk who are trying to decide how you're gonna if they're gonna fund you to go do your adventure, like you said, there's probably half or part of them that get it immediately and that for whom that resonates, and there's a cross section of those who don't. What do you find in common with the people who don't understand this? Yeah, well, I can tell you the people who do get it. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to pin you down to say who don't get it, but <laughs> let's, just, let's just go who does get it, who gets it. <laughs> I can tell you about who doesn't get it. but I'll, Let's just say who, it's maybe more fun, we'll keep it in the positive. Man, who, the, who gets it? The, the people who get it, um, it's folks, the, the folks that we end up working with, yeah. um, like Danny Reimer's on our board. Uh, I remember when I realized that he was the right person for Patreon. Um, he was on the board of SF MoMA. You walk into his house, it's full of sculptures and paintings. He's an art collector. Um, he would like commission artists from around the world to do things for his home. Um, like art is uh, it just, a, it's like a way of life for him. Um, people who understand the history and context of, of artistry and how it's been financed over yeah. time, those people look at this and they go, oh my God, this, of course. Is, this is how, this is how we fix what what the the last 20 years did to all these supply chains and, and distribution houses and, and infrastructure that we built over the last 100 years. Those people who understand that context, those are the folks that get it. And, and you know, the f folks who don't get it are, are folks who, like, they have no familiarity with creators. You say creator to them and they say, what's a creator? Um, they don't see this emerging class of people who are making things and uh, they don't sort of view it as a market. And that's, you know, it, if you're not in it, it's hard to see it emerging. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really important thing. We I have historically talked about sort of two, you know, as we think about who we make this show for, there's people who identify as creators and for whom we at Creative Live and the industry, I think, is trying to take them from one or two or three or five to ten. Like, yeah. how, do we, how do we help you grow and develop and, yeah. and, you know, maximize your creativity? And then there's another cross section of people that I don't want to ignore. That people I call them creative curious. And they're like, cool. Mm -hmm. Like I see this happening. I would love to stop doing the things that everybody else told me I had to do to oh. be a grown-up adult, and realize that chasing your passions, the distance between where you are and where you want to be, is much closer than you think. Yeah. And so if we were talking to this, uh, the the group trying to go from zero to one now, how do how what's the message that you would share to them about how to decide, because I think of it as a decision, maybe you'd think differently, but to decide to pursue the thing that you love, because you had to do that, mm -hmm. right? So tell me about w what message would you share with those folks, and by extension, how, do you, how did you make that jump? Yeah, what a great question. Um, you know, I have a particular viewpoint on this. I think I've kind of already expressed it around this is the best time in the history of humans to be an artist. I really believe that. There's no excuses at this point. 
you do not have to wait for somebody to stick out their thumb walking by you on the street and see your face and say, you're it, let me make you a star. Those days where there were three pipelines from giant conglomerates and media companies to the masses are over. The internet has made it possible and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for any human to speak and connect with other humans. Holy shit. Yeah, it's crazy. It's cool, I still, it blows my mind when yeah. I think about it. This is our first time meeting, for example. I just sent you an email. Yeah. Dude, love your stuff. Yeah. Let's chat. Like, exactly. That's how the world works now, and it used to not be that way. It, right? and, and that opportunity is, um, like, if you don't take advantage of that opportunity, no worries. <laughs> Do you need to get that? No, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, we just went through this big drill about turning our phones off. Um, yeah, if you don't take advantage of that opportunity, then you're making excuses. Like, this is, the, this is the best time. You have every tool imaginable. There are people who want to find you. There yeah. are, even if you're, a, let's say you're a total weirdo. <laughs> like, let's, yeah. say, let's say your art is so weird that you show it to 1,000 people and 999 of them say, mm, don't like that. Well, guess what? There are millions of people then on the internet that would like your work. Because if you're one in 1,000, there's 2 billion people on the internet. There's plenty of people yeah. to enjoy your work, make a living, build a business. Um, so, at, you know, at this point, it's just, it's, it's entirely up to individuals. Um, I think that's a really empowering thing. That's kind of what motivated me, motivated me and got me going about it. So let's talk a little bit about your personal journey then. Yeah. So give me a little bit about like backstory, childhood. Mm -hmm. um, like, were you a creator from day one? You knew what you wanted to do and, and uh, you set off trying to figure out how to do it, or did you have a, a winding and meandering path? Give me a little bit of that context. I mean, I've had it figured out since day zero. Nice. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, no, I mean, I I loved music as a kid, and uh, you know, I my dad was a, a doctor and mom was a nurse, um, but both musicians. My dad played the piano. My mom was a jazz singer. They would play together. So I grew up with like Cole Porter and the American Songbook. And wow. I mean, it was amazing. Um, I grew up listening to jazz and it's like a part of my music now. Um, my dad taught me the blues scale when I was six. So I was immediately like improvising and writing songs and stuff like that. Um, and then of course, all through high school and college, I was playing in bands and combos and, and jazz groups. Um, and then I got really, I, I remember, you know, starting when I was around 12 or 13, my parents got me a camera and I just filmed everything. I filmed, I have literally hundreds of hours of footage of just my life and hanging out with friends and I fell in love with filmmaking and storytelling. Um, and in college, there was a moment, I went into college thinking I'm going to be a physics major. And I remember the single moment where I, I realized fuck, I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> um, I was coming out of a physics lecture, and I was sitting there, and I just, I just glazed over, and I went outside, and I sat on a bench for like an hour by myself and just thought, look, I love music and filmmaking. Like, I, it's why I'm on Earth. Like, I, I, it fills me with joy and passion. It's what I think about all the time. I go to sleep thinking about stories and um, music videos and, and piano arrangements. And I dream music. I dream symphonies and, and arrangements and compositions. I, I, it felt like purpose to me. This whole physics thing feels like something different than that. I, I love, I still love physics and I'm a science geek. <laughs> Dear and physics, I still love you. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. But it's not my soul. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, there, there was that moment where I, I realized that, you know, I was going to be an artist and, and um, I applied to film school, got into film school, decided not to go because I was in a pop band. So decided to be in a pop band. Band didn't work out. <laughs> um, did... I ended up having to move back in with my uh, dad, and I lived with my parents post-school, which was so embarrassing, because all my friends, you know, I went to a good college, all my friends were getting high-paid jobs, and, like, I, I was, I remember, actually, it was, it was kind of humiliating, to tell you the truth. Like, it was embarrassing. And, uh, and I, I did it anyway, because I loved it, and I started making a little bit of money and selling MP3s and reaching people, and, and one thing led to the next, you know, and then, Pomplamoose came around, and uh, and for whatever reason, that combination of me and Natalie, who's now my wife, 
our music just really resonated with people and it took off. Um, and you know, we started playing huge venues and touring and selling lots of songs and building a fan base and, and, and that's kind of how I got into music. But you know, filmmaking has always been a part of that because I'm making YouTube videos and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. Well, that's what I appreciated in sort of tracing your, your history in, in preparation for our conversation today is it seems very intentional and the mix of, this is to me why it's very easy for both of us to sit here and say that it's the best time in the history of the world to be a creator because you're in charge of your own brand, you're using your own skills and some relatively inexpensive tools to create not just the music that you sell, but the world that that music gets to live in through videos, through um, things that you make for your fans, through mm -hmm. the platform that you, you know, websites and distribution channels and whatnot. I think that's really, really the at the core of what we're trying to get at here is that it's the first time in the history of the world where the gatekeepers are largely not there anymore. It's not to say they're absent because you still have, you gotta play by the rules of these, these channels, the distribution channels. YouTube has rules, for example, mm -hmm. but by and large, relative to every other time in history, you don't, they're, they're, it, these tools are, are democratized or, or near, near democratized. So if that's the case and you started making money doing the thing that you're doing, mm -hmm. you're still making music, right? Yeah, I've released two music videos a week. Okay. What, what's this whole other path and why are you picking up new things to do? Because you're, you're living your dream, right? You tapped in to getting to make a living and a life doing what you love, making music on the internet and using places like iTunes and YouTube to reach fans and mm -hmm. provide them value. What this whole Patreon thing, it's separate from that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, this, we're going deep now. We are. <laughs> this, this is, we're, we're going there. This cuts deep. Um, I could bullshit for a while, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I'm not going to. Okay. Uh, this was like really emotional for me. Yeah. One of the most difficult emotional transitions of my life. I, I, Patreon is, I work 12 or 13 hours a day. I don't have weekends. I'm all in it. Building a, a startup from scratch, building nothing from something, especially, sorry, building something from nothing, and especially doing it for the first time, um, especially as a non-technical CEO in Silicon Valley, um, managing people for the first time. It's my first job. Like, I'm all in. I have to be all in. Like, so many people have put their trust and faith in Patreon, from our investors to our employees to friends to people we've recruited. Um, anything less than giving my all to those people is unacceptable. Um, and so music, you know, one time a month for two days, I fly down to LA and I record for two straight days on a Saturday and Sunday. And then we put out those music, th those songs and videos over the course of a month. Um, so it's like this much of my time. <clears throat> and there's teams now that are helping do all that. My wife basically runs Pomplamoose. She's CEO of Pomplamoose. Um, but moving to that world where, I mean, you know, I describe music and, and the arts as my soul, right? Yeah. And it's not easy. It, it, is, it, it's, it doesn't get easier. Like it is, it's pain. And sending checks to my friends and people that I've been following for years, every month, you know, through Patreon, sending them money for doing what they do best and helping them be passionate and live their lives and live their dreams um, and fixing this problem. It's the, I can't describe the long-term reward of that, that, that uh, I literally, I feel it in my arms. Like it feels good in my arms. Like when I think about paying those people. And Do you have special arms? <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. It's like a physical it's, it, sensation. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you can't get more real than that. I can't, I can't and I, I can't describe it other than it just is so rewarding and feels so good. And, um, and it's the only thing, it's the only thing that could tear me away from making music and videos. Let me play devil's advocate because in sort of 
transparency and vulnerability, same exact set of circumstances in my mm -hmm. life, except as a photographer. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't, but why would you, you, like, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars as a musician, like, touring and playing, like, why would you possibly give that up? Isn't that the, aren't you giving up the best life ever to have sort of investors and a lack of freedom and have a ton of responsibility? Aren't you, isn't this doing it wrong? You're literally, you're, you're, you're yeah. playing the conversation that happens in my head. Because Jack has been in my head for years, too. <clears throat> I just want to hear how, how, how have you managed it. We can bond here yeah. uh, on video and audio about how we're, how we're managing this. But I, honestly, like, tell me, like, what's, the, yeah. what's your response when someone asks, like, wait, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, I, I love all of those things. And I've... I've um, I've stumbled into this thing. It was stumbling into it, right? Mm -hmm. Stumbled into Patreon. Um, the opportunity for growth and learning and the opportunity to be a CEO um, <laughs> I of a, I laughed. Of I a like, tech company? Yeah. Um, I would be a fool to snub, to, to, to give that up. I would be a fool to turn my nose up at that opportunity for growth and learning and to build those skills um, that will apply to everything I do for the rest of my life. Um, to, it, it feels like, um, it, yeah, it would, feel like a, it would feel like a fuck you to, to the universe, right? On so many levels, to, to me and to all the people that, um, that use Patreon to, to do what I love to do. Yeah. Um, and so there is an element of it, look, I, I I love it, and it is, it is ultimately, it's for me. And there's an element of it that is um, a moment where I feel like I can give back. You know, Patreon feels, it's a for-profit company. Yep. We want to make a profit. We have investors. You know, all those things are true. And it, it really is a moment where I feel like I'm giving something important to the world. Yep. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it, that ultimately overpowers any other feeling that I have. Um, as strange as that sounds. And, and you know, I, I, I say that, and it's true, and I still have that echoing conversation yeah. in my head. What am I you know? doing? Yeah. And, and, and part of the reason I'm asking you to share this, thank you, A, for being vulnerable, yeah. B, for just telling it like it is and, and putting it out there in the world for people to hear, and that is I want people at home to know that, like, very successful musician still has self-doubt wildly successful entrepreneur, you've raised $100 million, you, you're paying out hundreds of millions of dollars to creators all over the world, mm -hmm. still in your head saying, oh shit, what am I doing? Oh my God. Are people going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing? That <laughs> all this is the first time? I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth now, yeah, but yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm resonating with what you're saying about yeah. these are, it's almost like, it sounds to me like you're compelled. Am I putting words in your mouth or is no, that accurate? I mean, Look, everybody has imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I remember seeing a stat around the number of CEOs that have imposter syndrome, and something like 60%, um, uh, which blew my mind and made me feel way less alone. Um, but there's an look. It, it, there's an element of it that that's just like being alive. Um, building a company is like being a human. Um, you stumble. You make a lot of mistakes. If you do a really great job, you know. 30 to 40% of your decisions are good ones. Um, and you just have to have the grit and the guts to deal with some of the bad ones. Um, and you have to correct quickly and pick back up. I think the hardest part for me, um, I, there's a wonderful book uh, by Ben Horowitz called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I love that book. It's such a good book. It's, it's incredible. It for, I'm gonna just a small like digression. It's for people who are building companies, and it, it's instead of like most business books are this rosy like this is how you do it. If you were going to do it perfectly, you'd do it like this. Yeah. But the reality is nothing's perfect. This book is like how to fire your friend. Yeah. What it go? What what do you say to investors when you tell them you've lost all their money? Yeah. Like it's a series. Of, so you're reading a hard thing about hard things. Yeah. I mean, it, one of my favorite quotes from that book is like, uh, you know, when you ask CEOs like how they did it, the crappy CEOs will point to their brilliant strategic moves or, um, you know, key decisions in the path, blah, blah, blah. And the great CEOs say the same thing every time, which is, I just didn't quit. 
I just stumbled and fell and got back up without losing enthusiasm and pulled the mud out of my teeth and kept running. And then I fell face first again and, and slammed my head and woke up in the hospital and took off the bandages and kept going. And you just keep going. And that's why I think it's like life because you, know, you cannot prevent failure. Um, you, you, you misstep and misstep and misstep and build and build and recover and misstep and build and recover. And that process is the process of being a human being. It is also the process of building a company. Um, uh, so, so yeah, don't, don't quit, I guess. Like, keep, just keep going. And, and guess what? Everybody else is making mistakes too. Yeah. And they're showing you their highlight reel and you're comparing their highlight reel to your real life, yeah. which is confusing and painful sometimes, but yeah. just know, I think that's, again, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you're talking about building companies right now, and we've heard that as a musician, you found success creating Pompa Moose and other projects. Let's go to the Jack who's alone at night in his own head. Yeah. So last night at 4 a.m. Last night at 4 a.m. Okay. <laughs> like, play play the talk track. Yeah. From last night at 4 a.m. I'm not gonna do that. Okay. <laughs> fair. Just being honest. Yeah, no, no, that's fair. Okay, like, uh, paint a picture. Yeah. Of the what, difference yeah. between what people think there that that Jack Conti's talk track is and, and the reality. Okay, we're going deeper. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean. Look, it's all the things that, that you mentioned. It's, um, it's the replaying of moments, right? For whatever reason, I describe my brain as a Velcro, Velcro brain. I just, something happens and I can't unattach it. Um, I, I'll replay a moment and think about how I could have done it better or how I could have phrased my answer better, um, you know, or, or how I could have approached a situation better or a better version of the decision. I'm like a, uh, one of the things I have to combat at 4 a.m. by myself is just uh, I feel like some of your filters are down yeah. and your brain's just going. That's the monkey mind. It's that's the two, two million year old organ that's not there to make you happy. <laughs> it's to make you survive. Yeah. Yep. And uh, all my perfectionism just rears its ugly head in those moments. And, uh, and uh, you know, I usually work pretty hard to combat perfectionism because I think it can be, I've noticed that I'm a perfectionist. I like to make perfect things. And if I don't actively fight against that, and if, I'm, if I don't allow myself to be aware of that in every moment during the creation process, um, I never finish anything. I never publish anything because I'm always trying to make it better. And at a startup, like, you have to balance that with speed. You need great things, and those great things need to happen really quickly at a really good cadence. Yeah. Um, and so I think my 4 a.m. self is just uh, so disappointed <laughs> about the speed versus quality trade-off. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a never-ending struggle. So I'm going to summarize that in one word. I'm going to call it mindset. Yeah. So what are some things that you do to manage that mindset, knowing that it's in the mindset of every creator? some of the most successful human beings on the planet by every outward measure. Let's take Robin Williams, for example, mm -hmm. wildly successful. Tony Robbins tells stories about, you know, asking people all over the world, literally millions of people, like who liked, not, not who liked, who loved, you know, Mork and Mindy, who loved this guy? And Everybody 99 does. out of 100 people put their hands up. And yet he did not have, he had his, demons and took his own life. So like literally loved by billions and billions of people, won every award you can make in filmmaking, out, even outside his genre, the highest awards and still didn't find peace. So we know by a sort of negative example yeah. how important mindset is. And then we see in athletes and the best in class that the difference is less about skill and more about mindset in those, mm -hmm. in the success stories as well. So mindset is a thing. Yeah. What do you do, what does Jack Conti do to preserve a healthy mindset, to build himself and those around him up, uh, um, not just at 4 a.m., but just in life. Do you have a set of practices? Do you have a yeah. way of approaching things? How do you do it? Yeah, I have some specific things that I do, and then I just have some like general overarching principles. Um, I'll give you, I'll start with something really clear and specific. <clears throat> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, 
uh, a couple years ago, I realized that, and I, it, it slipped, it slipped on me. It just slowly developed. I realized that I was horrified of flying. I hadn't even like admitted it to myself, and then I realized that I couldn't get on an airplane, and I had been like. Uh, deferring on travel plans and making excuses to not go see friends who had moved cities and um, thanks, thank you. And I, 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 yeah, it was a terrible realization. I didn't even, I didn't even realize it was a thing and then suddenly I, I realized it. And so I went to cognitive behavioral therapy to get over this. Oh wow, cool. And um, it was about what a year and a half. What does cognitive behavioral therapy mean? It's like more based on action than it is like, so tell me about like your relationship with your parents. <laughs> okay. Like it's like things that you can do um, okay. and like techniques. It's more tactical. Okay. Um, and I had to like retrain my brain. <clears throat> and so the, the thing that eventually worked for me, and it doesn't work for everybody, this particular thing worked for me, was uh, you wear a rubber band around your wrist and when you start to have negative thoughts and feelings about flying, um, you just snap. pick up the rubber band, snap, and I am, you say, I'm healthy and safe and all's right in my world. And then immediately your brain goes back to flying and you snap again, I'm healthy and safe, until you do that over and over until, you just, until your brain just doesn't think about it. And then you keep living your life. And then a couple hours later, you start to drift into dark fantasy land about you know, the plane crash or whatever, you snap and you do it again. If you do that for, or when I did that for like eight or nine months repeatedly, eventually I noticed that the time between rubber band snaps just got longer and longer and longer until it was days and weeks. And then I took the rubber band off and now I'm not afraid of flying anymore. And it was a long retraining process um, where I just had to kind of, well, I don't want to say trick, but I had to force my brain into it. Um, and that's a technique that I've brought with me on a lot of things, is just like um, when I'm having unproductive thoughts that are not useful, I'm not going to take action on, they're just stupid things that are hurting me and my life, I just do a mental rubber band snap. Um, and I've, I've used that specific technique since then to kind of clear out the bullshit that you carry around in your head. And what I, I want to sort of try and put a bow on what you're saying, and that is that eight or nine months. So folks at home who think like you can just like snap that little guy or gal on your shoulder, oh, hey, beat it. Like we're talking about very successful Jack Conti has spent months and months and months around a thing like flying, and then we're able to apply that to other things. So how that's the level of commitment of and how important it is to have a mindset. Because you, could, you probably couldn't succeed in your job without the mindset. I wasn't mindset. succeeding in my life. Yeah. I wasn't succeeding in like keeping good relationships with people that I loved, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's powerful. So if you, to me, I think that's a really, uh, A, thank you for sharing that. Um, also, I'm, I'm, when, what's the right way of going at this? So if you are willing to put that much time into mindset, um, do you feel like that is a lifelong, like y y you talked about it and like, like okay, I cured myself of my fear of flying. Mm -hmm. But you also said, well, and I bring that into other areas of my life. So is this an ongoing struggle or is this a, you feel like you got to where you need to be? Yeah, so I, you know, um, I actually, I didn't use the word cure Mm -hmm. on yeah, purpose. That, that was mine. Bad. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I said I'm not afraid of flying anymore because I spend very, very little time being afraid of flying because mm -hmm. every time I am afraid of flying, I snap the rubber band. And so holistically, like how, how much time do I spend being afraid of flying? Maybe a few seconds a year. Yeah. Um, it's there. Yeah. And if I let it come back, I could let it come back, but, but you're, you hit the nail on the head. This is not like, you're not done with this ever. Um, it, you, it keeps going. And, and these you, are frameworks that you, yeah. that's why I love hearing what your, your sort of methodology is. And, yeah. and thank you for being super explicit about it. And whether oh, yeah. that works for you folks at home or listening or watching, um, uh, the takeaway for me is not just the tactic, it's that this is a thing. And 
you know, reference something I said earlier, we have a two million year old organ in our skull. Mm -hmm. Its job is to keep you uh, safe, not happy. <laughs> yep. And so we have to learn how to drive this thing. Exactly. Um, and this is a theme throughout the show. Like all the top performers that I've had on the show, they have a very, it's, it's a repeated theme that mindset is a focus. It's an area of focus and passion and, and they direct a lot of attention to it. So A, you're not alone, you know that. Um, but for the folks at home, it's really important to hear, I think over and over and over again. So we're gonna go from, again, thank you, that vulnerable place. We're gonna do uh, 180 nouns and I'm gonna say a couple of things that I am freakishly admirable of your ability to do. All right. And that is to win whatever win is to find success via crazy non-traditional methods. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I just, A, I, it's so fun to watch, you know, my friends and peers do that and you're a master. And I'll just use one very specific example, uh, which is you wanted to, when, when Casey Neistat, whom we both know, announced his 368 project, you thought there might be something with Patreon. And you live in San Francisco, Casey lives in New York, and you basically, you got his attention and went and had a meeting with him by very non-traditional modes. Yeah. Tell us that story. Yeah, I saw Casey launch 368. It was a super inspiring launch video. Um, it really felt like the beginning of something that he was gonna be spending you know, the next year on at least or, or more. Um, and uh, I, I wanted, you know, I thought it would be incredible if, because uh, one of the big pitches of 368 was let's help small creators, let's mm -hmm. help them um, get a jump start. And like, I, I thought, what if Patreon were financing that ability for 368 to get cr small creators a jump start? Um, I think that's something the community would be super excited about. People would totally pay monthly um, to help creators reach the world um, for the first time. And I thought this is a great opportunity. Um, so I made a video. I, mean, I, just, I just made a video, dear Casey Neistat from the CEO of Patreon. Um, and look, I know like Casey, I thought, God, he lo he's gonna love that. Like he's he gonna, videos, lo right? he loves videos. And plus like, I feel a sense of familiarity with his filmmaking style and his storytelling style. He's a genius and I wouldn't pretend to be as good as, as he is at oh, that. Oh man, you got the chops. Don't let me, don't let anybody kid you. You're an amazing <laughs> video maker, well, amazing thank you. filmmaker. Um, but I, you know, I've been influenced a lot by him and his storytelling. And I thought, you know, what if I, what if I make a video that's a little bit of an homage to Casey? So I can, I can show Casey, hey, look, I get you. And mm -hmm. like, I feel a connection to your style of storytelling, but I'm also gonna show you a little bit of, like, of my creative flair that yeah. I can sort of put on this, do something a little differently. Um, and I thought, you know what, if I make that video and I do it well, and I just publish it, like I just, I just put it up, um, I bet that Casey would see that and like, you know, like it, and also want to use that as an opportunity to create a splash and get a little spike and, you know, have the CEO of Patreon fly out to see him. And, um, and so I did, I made the video, I put it up, he saw it, he loved it. He did a couple tweets about it and invited me to come to New York and be in one of his videos. We made a video together. It was this awesome thing. It was so cool. And it was a chance. He asked me to like pitch Patreon on his channels. I got to like talk about Patreon on 10 million people. Casey's yeah. audience. It was like, such an awesome opportunity. Um, and yeah, it was a little, a little different, <laughs> a little untraditional, but I thought it was a cool, a cool chance. So if, if, if in the particular lies the universal, so in that example, what's the takeaway? What, and to me, this is, as I've yeah. watched your career and, and what you're building, and to me, this is, it's actually your MO. It's like how you do everything. Yeah. And so, I have a saying that you can't both stand out and fit in at the same time. I love that. What is it, like, how, if that is an example of how you sort of got to connect with Casey, what are some other things that you've done that are completely non-traditional? And the reason we're gonna, you know, I want to go down this line of questions is because people are home thinking I have to do it just like everybody else. And so let's try and free people of that through your own life examples. Yeah. What have you done differently Okay, I'll give you a really clear example. We have this model in our minds of how it's supposed to be. Oh, you're supposed to 
blank. This is how it's done. Um, and it is, you don't even realize those models are there. You, you've built them in your heads. There are these massive constructions. Um, and they're detailed and specific. And there's one, two, three, and steps and checklists. And they're, they're architected in our heads. And we're completely unaware of them. Um, and the takeaway is that all of those plans are total bullshit. <laughs> um, they're just BS. They don't exist. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a very clear example. I, uh, I went in for like our first few pitch meetings to VCs. And I, uh, I remember pitching Patreon. And I, you know, I was like, OK, these are VCs. There's like 12 you know, people around this table. And, I, and they're partners. And they've, given away, they've raised billions of dollars and given away. And they've you know, invested in these massive like, enterprise companies. And so I, I went in. You know, and I'm talking about patron retention and forecasted you know, revenue over the next year. And here's the retention cohorts of our creators and how they're performing over time. And these are the products that we lease that have driven these, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we're not raising any money. Do that over and over again. Not raising any money, no interest. And I finally went into one of these pitch meetings. I was like, yo. Here's me. Here's how Patreon started. And, it's a, and I tell the robot music video yep. story with pictures. And you see me rocking out with an electric guitar and a robot head singing the lyrics to a song. And everybody around the table is like looking at each other and looking at these slides. What is this dude? This is crazy. And like it was this moment where there was like I, I had this model in my head of like, I'm a CEO and here's how CEOs are supposed to be. And here's, what, here's how you raise money and you talk about these sorts of things. And like, all that was wrong. Like, it turns out investors want to see somebody who's really passionate about solving a problem and is connected to their customers and cares deeply about what matters to them. And like, that's how you raise money, um, at least in the early stages. Toward, toward the, the you know, later rounds, it's, it's more about company performance. But I, d I just didn't realize that at all. Um, and, and it really hit home for me when I was supposed to give a presentation uh, and a lot of people were going to be there. Um, a lot of people, you know, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett, and a lot of people are in the audience like that. And um, I remember talking to our investors about this presentation. And Danny Reimer, the mm -hmm. investor I mentioned earlier, he's like, he was like, dude, tell the robot story. And I was like, uh, really? You want to play Really? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that's that. Like, tell that story. And I did, and it was awesome. Um, but yeah, we, we just, we have these models and they're wrong. I think that's just, there's so much embedded in that story. And it's not just with investing and it's not just with how to build a company. It's just not with, it's with everything. All the rules, those rules were largely meant or largely put there in place by people who are trying to keep you out of something, not give you permission to go into it. So it's like, this is another pattern that I just I am so passionate about reinforcing is that there's no right way. If there's anything, in addition to that, it's never been a better time than now to be a creator. The corollary to that is that, and there's a thousand paths to get there, and no one path for one person looks like another path for somebody else. Oh, and that's such a truth in and of itself. Is that, you know what has worked for me mm -hmm. is not going to work for some other person. And, and I can't just open up a rule book from someone else's life and their trajectory and follow what they did because it probably won't work for me either. Companies are the same way. Like you'll, sometimes people will say things, you know, when you're, when you're building companies, they'll say, well, at Facebook, they do X, Y, and Z. It's like, well, we're not Facebook yeah. <laughs> for Sweet. so many reasons. They're, they're down the street, <laughs> so you can go there. Um, and yeah, you know, Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't, and we all have to use our own judgment to kind of figure out what works for us. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what it is. It's like, hey, is this working for me right now at this particular moment in time? And if it's not, adjust and figure something else out. Talk about being uncomfortable. How much of a role does that play in your, your personal life, your career professional? Just like, are you always comfortable? Do you create comfort for yourself as a sort of nurturing thing or is being mildly uncomfortable or is it like Mario Andretti that if you're not almost crashing, you're not driving fast enough? Where do you fit on that spectrum for of like sort of uncomfortability in your day to day? Yeah. Um, so this is one of those moments where I, I want to re-echo the last point I had, which is like this may not be right for the folks watching. Yes. But for me, it's, it's just where, I, it's where I've played. Um, 
especially in building Patreon, I would say I spend 95% of my time feeling very uncomfortable. Like, more uncomfortable than I, I've, I had ever imagined I'd be willing to feel for those extended periods of time. Um, now, an interesting thing happens when you do that to yourself. Uh, you, you develop a new baseline. Um, it's it's kind of like just tolerance. It's like you get a new threshold. Muscle. Yeah, a muscle. Mm -hmm. um, a muscle. You know, it, it's it's funny because humans have that ability. Um, if you, uh, you know, uh, if you go through the death of a parent, uh, you know, s you can't imagine living without that parent. And you know, the six to 12 months after that is just the worst kind of grief and discomfort and horror that you can imagine. It's, it's brutal. And then we get better. We feel better. Nothing has changed. Your mom is still gone. And it's less painful. It's weird to say, and it's just true. And, um, you know, so so that has I've noticed that that phenomenon has happened to me over time. My threshold for emotional pain and for discomfort has just gone way way up. Things that I do now at a pretty regular cadence, um, you know, I'd have to kind of emotionally prepare for for weeks yeah. five years ago, and now I just kind of do those things on a daily basis. Um, and you know, one of our one of our investors said to me. Um, what was the quote exactly? It's like, hey, your life, um, you know, you can measure your life by the number of difficult conversations that you're willing to have. <laughs> um, if you stray away from the things that are uncomfortable, I think you're, you're just staying inside the bumper lanes. You're just going to, you're just going to coast. And, um, you know, that might feel good in a particular moment, but I think over the long run, that's, that's not the way I want to do it. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. What's a thing or a couple of things about you that other people from the outside wouldn't know to be true? They would be surprised, like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that Jack Conti fill in the blank. Whoa, what a cool <laughs> question. Um, okay, uh, this one, uh, this, is a little, this is a little intense. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty warm person. I'm pretty, uh, like, amiable. <laughs> and um, I think, like, when I, I'm empathetic, and so when people meet me, like, I'm excited. And all those things are true. And, and all of that is, it is true. Um, and uh, I'm also not afraid to um, uh, do things that are going to make me um, not liked. What's an example? Um, Does it make hard decisions with friendships? Is it like make decisions as a boss? Is it yeah, push make, people away because you're afraid or what? What? I mean, at, at a at a company, you can't get consensus on things. If you try to get consensus, you'll never make any decisions. Yeah. And so now I find myself in a place where I often sit down and talk with folks and say, "Hey, I'm going to do something that you disagree with, and here's why I'm going to do it." and the decision is final. And um, so I wanted to let you know, and what I heard from you was X, Y, and Z, and here's why you want to do it, and here's why I wanted to do this thing, and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this thing the way that I want to do it. Um, and I have those conversations, like, regularly now. And I think it probably would be surprising to people who see me as just, like, so open to feedback, and I am, I'm super open to feedback, yeah. I'm super open to, like, talking to people, I'm friendly, I'm warm, I'm all those things. Um, but I also want to get things done. There's to that, yeah. Yeah, I want to move. I want to I want to get results. I want to like send money to creators, and that means like um, that um, sometimes I am warm and firm. Um, I can work on that. I haven't nailed that balance. I'm not an expert at it, but um, but yeah, I'll, I'll I'll I have to do things at this scale where where not everyone's going to be happy, and I'm I'm willing to do those things. What's what are some of your favorite things? Favorite things. Yeah. What are some of your favorite things? 
Oh, peanut butter and jelly. Favorite things, like physical yeah, things. Yeah, things or, or, or yeah. favorite things in the world. I love like, old like, instruments. Uh, instruments. Old instruments from the 60s and 70s. Um, there was an analog quality and sound to those instruments, and some of the keys don't, aren't quite perfect, and they have so much character, and they're dusty, <laughs> and there's a little bit of a buzz when you plug them in, and you know there's a tone wheel organ with a giant thing that's spinning, and it plugs into a Leslie speaker with cones that are going like this, and you can control the speed of the rotation of the cones, and it changes the way the cones sound as they emit frequencies, and... I just think that shit's so cool. I'm a geek. I'm, I love I love those physical, mechanical things. Um, and even when I'm filmmaking, I find myself gravitating towards practical effects as opposed to like CGI or or After Effects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're not a big plane flyer. You don't love it. But I I want to know. Do you have some favorite places to go? Do they require planes? And have you gotten over it? You know, I I I'm, I feel a little weird about this, but. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not like a travel nut. Um, and it's not that I don't love being exposed to new things in course, different places, yeah. and the world is an awesome place, and it's great, but I don't get a lot out of being in a place. Um, I, I'm, I like ideas and execution and making things, and I can make things wherever I have tools. And so like, I'm happiest where my tools are. <laughs> Um, I know that's probably no, like that's really cool. lowbrow. This is this is like uh, this is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Food. What what do you like? Um, I'm a picky eater. Cool. Um, Describe <laughs> it. <laughs> so funny. And then if you didn't go for any snacks like we have over there in the catering area, I, I would probably like those snacks. I I don't like uh, cultured dairy. Hate sour cream. Hate okay. yogurt. Um, I won't eat cheese. I I, I got to eat melted cheese. I, I I only eat cooked cheese. So I'll eat pizza, but I won't eat a block of cheddar and crackers. Um, I don't like raw fish. I don't eat like offal meats or or like weird stuff. I get skittish around that stuff. Um, one area where I'm not willing to be uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I love it. This is why I'm asking you. Um, um, yeah, I think you know artists. Probably, artists that I love. Yeah. Um, a, a few that are just like in, just in me. Um, uh, Brad Meldow, the piano player, jazz pianist, one of the most lyrical uh, and incredible pianists I, I think in history, and um, uh, and also just a, an incredible combination of I call it in and out, um, like beautiful and weird. He balances those two things. He'll be he'll play this wonderful line, and then it kind of goes in a really weird direction, and then comes home, and the balance of that in and out is just. But he does it right to how I like it. I mean, it's incredible. I love listening to him play piano. Uh, uh, Jean Pierre Jeunet. Oh, amazing filmmaker. I mean, all I of those movies. All of those movies over and over and over. Yeah, City of Lost Children. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, those films. And, and Amelie, of course. I remember yeah. seeing Amelie and just being like, this masterpiece. Masterpiece, yeah. This yeah. um, is uh, my wife's favorite filmmaker, too. She's just really? like, just, just perpetually <laughs> a Jeunet film line. I mean, they're, he's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Tim Burton, as a kid, like, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, God, those, the the... Talk about in and out. I mean, he, the sort of two world themes of his movies um, have forever affected my art. Like, I, I literally make music videos that are just basically short Tim Burton things. Whereas, like, the verse is this one type of world, and the chorus is this, like, you know, fake, perfect, pleasant villi kind of world. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I love Tim Burton. I think he's an incredible filmmaker. Drop a couple of books. You've, you'd already said The Hard Thing About Hard Things mm -hmm. by Ben Horowitz. Yeah, Creativity, Inc. by Ed Catmull. Yeah, amazing. Incredible book. Um, what a wonderful thinker and so many good ideas in that book. Pixar, Pixar guy, for those mm -hmm. who don't know. Yeah. There's a book called Good to Great that I just finished, which I love. They just It's a really cool concept. They just look at companies that outperform the stock market by 3x or something over a period of 15 years, and they dive deep into what made those companies great. How did they have sustained high performance for such a long period of time? 
And like the things that come out of that exploration are so counterintuitive and awesome and uh, really wonderful insights around like humility and ambition for something outside of yourself. Instead of ambition for yourself, it's ambition for a cause or a, or a, or a problem or an identity. Um, so that book was really wonderful. I, I, I love that book in particular. Love it. I just tried to traipse across like food and <laughs> just yeah. a bunch of weird things. Anything else like uh, under the heading like things things Jack likes? Things I like. Um, <laughs> this is a say. Uh, this is my first time doing this sort of a concept, but oh, it's cool. Yeah, um, yeah. I like. Um, I like. I'm an introvert. I recharge when I'm alone. Um, uh, that probably also surprises people. I think people see my like the video making and yeah 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 but i'm like every other youtuber like or not every other many youtubers were on camera they're like oh, so like right now yeah. i'm all excited and pumped and we're yeah. having a great conversation and um and then you know if you put me in a party like i just freeze <laughs> and like i don't know what to say and like i don't know what to do with my hands I, oh my <laughs> god literally i feel like my hands are huge and i like i can't i don't feel natural and i'm like walking around my... oh it's yeah so i i like um you know, when I was making music, I'd be in a dark room by myself for 12 hours a day. Um, I, have, I, I love that because I can just, I can do work and um, be creative and, and just, uh, you know, own the process. I think that the, uh, I, I just, it's so wonderful to feel humanity. I think that's what I love about long form conversations is you can actually, and you know, you've done a lot of media because of your role in life, me the same, everything gets chopped up into sound bites. Yeah. Just, I just wanna say thank you so much for sort of just being able to tell the long version of, I don't know what to do with my hands <laughs> um, for, for, for everybody at home. Um, what's, what's on the horizon for Patreon? Yeah. Um, you guys have acquired a couple of new companies recently. Uh, one that's a white label that people are gonna pull it on their own platform. Exactly. Um, and another one. Yeah, Kit. So we made two acquisitions recently. Um, uh, and they're all sort of wrapped up in this concept of membership. What does it mean to be a member in the digital world? Um, I think we all have pretty good concepts of what that means in the, in the physical world. Mm -hmm. and, and Patreon is exploring and defining what that means to be a member online, um, a member of a creator um, in their, their business. Um, and so one of the things that's important to this concept of membership is recognizing and rewarding patrons and making sure that those members feel special and get some uh, exclusive content, exclusive access, feel yeah. a little closeness with the creator. And so one of the, the initiatives that we're doing and, and the folks that, um, uh, you know, on Kit are now working on merchandise through Patreon as a way of rewarding patrons and thanking them for their, for their patronage and their membership. Um, and so that team is building out, you know, uh, fulfillment and partnerships and how to make sure that that members are um, are getting rewarded with physical goods if the creator wants that for their yeah. membership program and right. what those what the right. business logic is around that you know do you get it when you hit a hundred dollars do you get it after you know six months or a year and do you get it when you you know up your pledge value to a certain so whatever it is so they're they're defining how um, you know merchandise interfaces with with uh, with patreon and creators and members um, and then this white label thing um, that you that you mentioned is a company called uh, memberful with just an incredible uh, founder and CEO um, this fellow drew who he and I just see the world in the same way we just see the web going in the same direction wonderful human being um, and uh, very mission driven so obsessed with customers and helping creators um, so outward focused his ambition is is all outside of himself wonderful person um, and memberful is going to allow us to essentially uh, offer patreon but without any of patreon's branding uh, uh, so if you want to run a membership program on your own website with your own colors and your own button text and your own systems and your own plans um, it doesn't look like Patreon at all. It doesn't even look like Memberful. You can run it so that it just looks like you're interfacing a fan and a creator. And there's a, there's a big group of people that are like, you know what, I don't like Facebook, I don't like YouTube, I don't want a platform in between me and my fans, I want a direct relationship. I don't want branding walls between us. Um, I just want it to be, you know, fan and creator. And Memberful allows people to take those experiences, build their own websites, fully customize them, um, and, and have a more uh, 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 branded particular experience that they're looking for. This is a new chapter. Yeah. That's very, very cool. What about for you personally, new chapter? 
or is it just more of the same? You get your head down and you're working that, you know, that 16, 19 hour day that we talked about. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's, what's sort of what's new and next for Jack? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the thing about startups is it's always new and next. It's completely consuming, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's. <laughs> just look at these bags under my eyes. You look great, by the way. I don't know how you do it. I'm yeah. like, oh, I feel like. Especially for being up at 4 a.m. last night. Yeah. I was, um, I was up there with the monkey mind, too. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it feels like every couple months is a new chapter. I mean, we just crossed about 170 folks. And um, gosh, it's a different thing. Yeah. It's a different, um, it's a different company at a, you know, 170 is so different than 100, is so different than 50. Um, and so whole new set of challenges, whole new set of like communication systems and, and Katie's helping us with all that kind of stuff. Yes, Katie. Um, whole new <laughs> set of like, you know, now you have like several layers of, of management at the company. You have to make sure those folks are empowered and um, autonomous and uh, have the, all the information that they need and uh, and that's a whole new set of challenges, and so so yeah, the next chapter is just continuing to scale Patreon, which it's it's just it's a lot of change very quickly. Um, yeah, you've been really clear throughout the conversation about you've always done such an elo eloquent job of of qualifying your answers. Like, well, this is how I would do it, mm. realizing mm -hmm. everyone's got their own path. Yeah, can you give any absolute advice? Yeah, don't quit. That's it. And it's just a repeat of that Ben Horowitz advice. <clears throat> I think a lot of people don't realize that succeeding at something and failing at something feels the same for a long, long time. It feels exactly the same. And so many times people feel that, feel that, feel that for this long, long time, and then they give up right here. And they don't realize that right here is when something clicked, um, would have clicked, but they gave up here. And uh, don't quit, keep going. Get through that point. Be okay with that feeling. Know that everybody else feels like they're failing too. Um, make it through, have the grit to just, to just face plant in the mud, brush it off, stand up, smile, pull the mud out of your teeth, and charge forward. I cannot think of a better way to end an interview at risk of like ruining that. I'm just gonna <laughs> moonwalk away from that one because that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your story with us, being transparent, vulnerable, open, and um, some just amazing nuggets of wisdom in there. Super grateful for you being on the show, bud. Thank you, Chase. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. All right, signing off. See you again, probably, hopefully, tomorrow.